listen to Xi Jinping. He has tremendous hubris, and his commitment to communist ideology is unshaken. He's talking every day in China about the Wu Wang Chu Xin. Uh, don't forget that your original commitment. Uh, what is the original commitment? Basically, is the communist ideology. Mao Xu, chief China strategist in the State Department during the Trump administration, unpacks China and the Communist Party. The Chinese communist, Marxist, Leninist commitment to that kind of ideology to make China the leader, the leading force of the ultimate triumph of global socialism. America is a country of consequence. Uh, we're the country that was most generous whenever there is a natural disasters in the world that occur. And the world has to have the United States at the forefront for freedom. Thank you, Dr. Yu, for joining Zoomi in China today. My pleasure. You talked about this new strategy that the Trump administration has developed. Uh, I was wondering, uh, is that a whole of a government a strategy to deal with China? Kind, kind of like what China has been doing for all these years. They have policy consistency and uh, long-term yeah. goals. The U.S. does not. What, what about now? Okay, so United States is a country of diverse political interest groups. And uh, the country does not really act on unanimity of opinions. And you have uh, so many political forces at play at any given moment. So uh, when we say whole of government, and uh, is not the same as whole of society. Government and society are separate in the United States because of democracy. I can tell you though, it is a whole of government. When I was in the government under Trump administration, Virtually every agency of the United States government, federal government, mm -hmm. uh, had a very clear understanding of the danger the Chinese Communist Party posed to the United States. And I think, you know, um, under the leadership of President Trump and uh, uh, particularly uh, Secretary Pompeo in the State Department, our foreign policy uh, has a very clear uh, uh, understanding of the nature of the Chinese Communist Party. Mm -hmm. and have a very clear understanding of what we're facing. So, yes, there was a whole of government. But I have to qualify to, to say, uh, to follow immediately, though, uh, that is, uh, the United States government is uh, limited in power because it is constitutional democracy. Mm -hmm. When we say a whole of government, that doesn't necessarily mean that government can do whatever it wants. Yeah. We, as a government, uh, um, uh, cannot really tell, say, the companies in Silicon Valley what to do, what to do, um, as long as they do not violate the U.S. laws. Mm. So uh, I think, you know, uh, that is actually one of the major inadequacies of democracy, one of the challenges that uh, democracy faces when dealing with totalitarian regimes. Right. The Chinese government, as you mentioned earlier, um, uh, has total control of human and material resources. They could do a lot of things. Xi Jinping has been saying, you know, uh, um, we can master uh, uh, all our forces um, and resources to do big things. Uh, and I think, you know, uh, that's a challenge. On the other hand, though, uh, there's one advantage on our side, that mm -hmm. is, this is a country of incredible creativity and ingenuity. We can all uh, be one step, two step ahead of our adversaries. And that has been proven true for the last 200 plus years. Mm. So we're not totally out of pace in our response to China. And I think, you know, I, I remain very optimistic in that. Okay, talk. This is a very interesting area because uh, people have been trying to compare whether a totalitarian regime using all their resources to the government decide which direction we should go in terms of innovation, industrial policies, and stuff like that. Would that be a more effective uh, approach than in a free society in capitalism? You let the private sector to decide yeah. where you want to go. Which, yeah. what do you think? Free market system has enormous, enormous potential. It has a great advantage over non-market economy, a non-market-oriented society. Having said that, 
And there is a precondition for free market to operate. That is, it has to be operated in the open society. Mm -hmm. Once you have the open society, you create opportunities for your adversaries to take advantage. Right. So, and that brings up another question that is, uh, how do you protect your vital industries? Mm. As a government, its primary responsibility is to protect your own critical industry and to protect your own people. And the most permanent, the most sort of a pernicious danger to that kind of a lack of protection comes from China. China has been pilfering the technologies, particularly critical military, industrial, and trade secrets of the United States and technologies right. for decades. So it is absolutely imperative for the U.S. government to immediately impose some kind of specific steps to protect ourselves. Right. And I think the Trump administration did, um, did more than any other previous administrations uh, in my memory. And I think we basically put so many critical in infrastructure um, uh, under our protection. And uh, our FBI's and a lot of law enforcement agencies have stepped up uh, its measures against Chinese espionage, um, against their uh, military and industrial um, theft. And we also have enacted several self-protection um, trade policies. And President Trump basically said, you tariff, right? So that's actually protect a lot of American industries. Um, we also forced China to follow certain rules that they promised it, it would. Uh, that's the, basically the essence of the phase one trade talk with China. Mm -hmm. It's not just about how much goods that Chinese should buy from America, from America. It's actually about how China's systemic unfair policies right. and its institutional uh, uh, flaws affect the Chinese-U.S. economic and trade uh, relationship. Mm -hmm. So we forced China to comply to that. And had, not, had there not been COVID, and we would have seen a tremendous progress in that regard, particularly when it comes to enforcement uh, stage. So, uh, so to answer the question in a very sort of detour way, uh, yes, we have to do it, but first and foremost, we have to protect ourselves. So right. this protection is first step. So Dr. Yu, would you say on the level playing field, the American system with innovation, strong innovation, free economy, can all compete the Chinese system. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, uh, because um, an open system uh, like the one the United States has can actually, number one, incentivize Chinese uh, um, people. So that can unleash tremendous ingenuity and creativity. And so um, uh, I think that Chinese people are also pursuing that. And that's one of the reasons why the Chinese economy uh, has grown so much in the recent decades. You are so right about that. Yeah, yeah. So uh, That's the only thing yeah, they did. The most important thing we have to keep in mind about Chinese economic system is that virtually the entire growth, economic growth, comes from uh, the uh, non-state sectors. Yeah. So the, the government-run SOEs, uh, almost none of them is actually uh, uh, profitable. So they're, they're basically they're, they're parasitical in a way. Uh, even though we stayed monopoly with tremendous subsidies and it still is not really performing. So in the free market system, in a, a, a level playing field, and those companies should not exist. And that's where, um, that's why private system, um, pri private uh, uh, entrepreneur system will ultimately triumph. This is basically the major ethos of modern history. Anybody who, that goes against that has failed. So um, uh, what the Chinese government has done is to use state power to selectively promote uh, non-performing sector under its total control and use the international free market system to benefit, to reap the benefits of the free market system globally. Mm -hmm. And that's why if we take action collectively, say at WTO and or the G7, and we basically try to stop the Chinese unfair practice, using its state subsidy, uses state power to monopolize certain trade, and then we will, we will win. So that's why you mentioned about the uh, leveling the playing field. That's very important. Mm -hmm. So in the end, you think the of China, the, how, how do you say it, the 
um, of China wouldn't succeed. Uh, for example, they, the Chinese government has supported Huawei so much yeah. and they gave them all the resources and, and, and stuff like that. In the end, you think this approach won't work? This approach won't work and also definitely is actually against the international free market system. It should be stopped, right? So uh, uh, Huawei is a company with tremendous government support. And it, with that support, they can actually compete easily against its rivals uh, uh, globally. And so before long, they could easily just uh, 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 kick out uh, uh, Ericsson and Nokia and even Samsung uh, from the global competition because they have a powerful government with enormous, almost unlimited economic uh, backing, right? So that's not fair. And also it's against uh, the fundamentals of the free market system. Um, that should not be allowed. Uh, the U.S. learned a lesson early on. You know, there's a ZTE, uh, 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 I think it's Chinese, Zhongxin. ZTE was 100% owned by the Chinese government. And it did something wrong against, against the uh, U.S. law. So the U.S. government fined it with the enormous amount. And ZTE didn't care because they said, okay, we'll pay it. Mm -hmm. That's because it's not a company that pays the fine. It's the Chinese government that pays the fine. Right. So free market rule doesn't even apply to a state-sponsored economic operation. And that's why the Chinese economic system is fundamentally incompatible mm. with global free market system. And that has to be changed. People have to address that from the macro level. We cannot continue pretending that China is a free market system. We can trade as if it's just one of many rivals. Uh, no major nation, no major Western industrial nation, no major international financial economic institution recognizes Chinese economy as a free market economy. And that's why we have to really apply our industrial and economic policies to conform with that reality, mm -hmm. that fact that Chinese economy is not a free market economy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's so amazing how the world's view on China has changed since President Nixon visited China and China opened up in the 1970s. For decades, the world's consensus has been, you know, the rise of China was good. Yeah. And, and that changed like, almost like overnight to people. And I, you, I know you are in the midst of this. And tell me how this uh, policy, policy this reorder of China policy came about. Okay, so um, I think the world has tremendous good wishes for the Chinese people. The rise of China actually is a great thing for the world. You have so many people who are now better off. They're engaged in economic uh, operations globally. And so I think we all benefit from that. The, so since Richard Nixon's visit to China in 1972, the world has changed, as you said. Um, Cold War is over. A global power realignment, realignment, uh, realignment has occurred. Uh, so that, those are tremendous changes uh, that we, we have uh, embraced with great delight and glee the coming of information age and the computer age and space, cyber. There's tremendous progress on the material level. But there are some, there are some also um, continuity and constancies that have not changed. And, Number one, the biggest consistency, big, biggest continuity is that China still is ruled by the same Marxist-Leninist political party. Mm. That party still embraces and practices the exactly the same kind of uh, controlling dictatorial uh, 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 mechanism um, in China as if has, China has not changed. Right? So the fundamentals of China's political system remains the same, despite the fact that materially, economically, China has changed dramatically. So this is probably is one of the biggest irony of our, our times. Um, and, and also, uh, that irony is very clearly felt, not only in China, but increasingly it's felt internationally because as China rises economically, um, uh, China's model of governance, the fact that China is still ruled by Marxist Leninist party with a innate control urge to rule the country with iron fist and with this uh, uh, normal 
and what they consider as a regular and a normal a normative methods such as propaganda, united front, uh, party system, and uh, um, uh, population control, and all those things is now spilling over to the international arena. Right. Uh, so be, uh, that's why people were, were looking at the rise of China with tremendous sense of uncertainty and even fear, right. because China's uh, marching into the global uh, uh, stage uh, is also um, um, uh, this. Uh, at the same time, it also brings the uh, to the world something that China has been doing domestically for decades. And that's something that uh, we, we cannot really uh, tolerate. And it, during the Trump administration, this was felt very clearly. And uh, we abandoned the illusion, somehow, free market system in the world and the virtue of democracy would inspire the Chinese Communist leadership to change, to be more liberal, to make it a more responsible stakeholder, as the cliche goes. And that is an absolute illusion and uh, has been dashed by not only the reality, but also by the rhetoric of the Chinese Communist Party. You listen to Xi Jinping, he has a tremendous hubris, and his commitment to communist ideology is unshaken. He's talking every day in China about Wu Wang Chu Xin. Uh, don't forget that your original commitment. Uh, what is the original commitment? Basically, is the communist ideology, the Chinese communist, Marxist, Leninist commitment to that kind of ideology that to make China the, leader, the leading force of the ultimate triumph of global socialism. Mm -hmm. He made the speeches all over the places, and it is actually foolish for the world, for policymakers, uh, to ignore that reality and that rhetoric. So, um, uh, so this, is, this is something that we have to realize. And I think, you know, during the Trump administration, under the leadership particularly of uh, Secretary Pompeo, we at the State Department had the extensive discussion about all this. And, um, and I think, you know, we had a collective realization that something had to be done. And uh, something had to be done because partly what we have been doing before had failed. Right. So that failure was not only recognized by the Republicans, but also by Democrats, right? Many of the Democrats who are now in power in charge of Asian policy were the first to come out and say, you know, our engagement policy with China, with the hope that China would, would become more liberal, more like us, has failed. And that failure has cost them uh, dearly. And now it's time for us to re-engage China from the totally different perspective. Um, so, and we have set up, we set up a, a new set of rules. Uh, reciprocity, for example, is one of them. And we also uh, uh, focus on results, not just the banquet and dialogues. Um, and so um, we see through that. And I think, you know, we did a, a tremendous good to the American people. Right. I'm just curious, when did you start to say China is still ruled by a Marxist, Leninist a power, because I think uh, just a few years ago, probably a big percentage of the American leadership or the world leadership would not buy that. They think, oh, China's already changed. When did you start to say okay. that and then people start to accept? Well, we say that, you know, uh, when I went to the State Department, you know, um, and, uh, um, and I worked with Pompeo, um, and uh, soon after that, we had some discussions and he began to, to, to use those, uh, mm -hmm. those terms. It's, yeah, it's a little bit, little bit of surprising to me because Americans were generally, uh, in general, averse to using terms like Marxist-Leninist Party to designate something that they were familiar with during the Cold War. They had this um, unrealistic uh, um, realization that with the downfall of the Berlin Wall, communism was over. Marxism-Leninism no longer fashionable. Now, I have to say, in China, that is true because most people, majority of people in China among the people, they don't believe in Marxism Leninism anymore. They were very enthusiastically pursuing all the major status symbols of bourgeois lifestyle, right? Mm -hmm. Cars, housing, fancy clothes, and you know, uh, 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 major uh, Western brands of clothing and uh, sportswear. So. Those things were basically what occupied ordinary Chinese people. 
But the Chinese people are powerless in China. The people in charge of the whole big country, the people who control all the assets, uh, assets in China, is a very small, relatively small group of Chinese Communist Party elites. They are the diehard believers of Marxism and Leninism. They are the ones who decide where the country goes, and they have total control of information. The information actually is very important uh, for us to, to, to understand because the information control, the uh, firewall, is so complete that ordinary Chinese people do not have the a diverse sources of information frame to make their judgment um, mm -hmm. uh, very accurate. So they're bombarded with disinformation by the Chinese government, government propaganda machines. With that, obviously, their judgment inside China is not very, very accurate sometimes, particularly when it comes to issues like Uyghurs and uh, like uh, the, the US true intention of engaging China. And so everything related to the United States is being misinterpreted and misinformed, deliberately uh, misinformed, I would say. Um, so they weaponize information. And I think that's one of the things that, that, that we, we really have to re, uh, uh, make a distinction. On number one, the Chinese people do, not, do no longer believe in Marxism and Leninism. On the other hand, the, the, the group of people that really matter in China mm -hmm. do believe it. So that's why we make our policy, we talk about the Chinese Communist Party. You pay, you pay attention closely to what Secretary Pompeo's speeches uh, when he was uh, uh, at, at the uh, State Department. He always referred to the Chinese government as Chinese Communist Party. Right. The party controls the government. Yeah. He um, so uh, that's very accurate. Uh, he always refers to uh, Xi Jinping as general secretary of Chinese Communist Party. Not he never calls the president uh, mm -hmm. in the same way that we never call. I mean, during Reagan years, for example, President Reagan never called Gorbachev the president of Soviet Union. He was always general secretary Gorbachev. And that's very accurate. And I think, you know, uh, we're not trying to ideologicalize uh, um, uh, the reality. We're just trying to describe in the reality accurately. Right. That's what Xi Jinping is. So um, um, we based our China policy on something that's very accurate, uh, some realistic. And right. I think we did a good thing. You mentioned President Reagan. I think uh, what I think about President Reagan was, um, you know, the Biden administration talks about, you know, working with allies. And uh, I mean, for majority of the people, I think this is, they are all for working with allies. But I think working with allies and working with allies could be different. So you either, you could have a Reagan mentality where you believe uh, the Soviet Union is the evil empire with the name of the game being, we win, they lose. Or you could have another mentality where you think China is only a normal rival. So you compete with them in some areas and work with them in others. Yeah. When dealing with today's China, dealing with today's Communist Party of China, which mentality do you think we should adopt? I think, you know, President Reagan was a great president uh, for a number of reasons. One of the most important ones, I think, is because of his ability to communicate with the American people. Uh, some very fundamental truth, mm -hmm. not only about America, but also about the, uh, uh, America's opponents, right, adversaries. He called the Soviet Union an evil empire, and he told Americans why. And uh, that ability to communicate with the American people in unambiguous terms, and that's very important. And I think American um, presidents should really learn from him. That's why he was called a great communicator. Um, so. That's number one. Number two, about working with allies. You know, the funny thing is, uh, if we keep talking about working with allies, we may run the risk of shirking Americans' res responsibility as a leader of world, world democracies. Mm. For whatever reason, you like it or not, America is a country of consequence. We are a big country. We're leading the world in many, many ways, not just the economic, not just the military powers, but also we are the most outspoken country against human rights violations globally. Uh, we're the country that was most generous 
whenever there is a natural disasters in the world that occur. We're the country that use our tremendous commitment to global peace to make sure that bloodshed will be minimized, right? So our outreach is global. Uh, if we keep talking about working with allies, sometimes people just use the excuse not to lead. Not we, to decide. Not to decide. We have to be really cognizant of the Americans' leadership role. Mm. And the world has to have the United States at the forefront for freedom. And this is basically the history of the world for the last uh, over 100 years has proven this, right? Mm -hmm. So we have to work with the allies, but we have to take the lead. Right. You have to and balance those two. You, you have to balance the two. Yeah. Allies are enormously important for us. And we, um, I, it is also a, a complete misstatement. It's, 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 it's a wrong idea that somehow the Trump administration totally uh, abandoned uh, our allies. Mm -hmm. We didn't. We tried to convince our allies that China poses the most dangerous threats to Western democracy, to international system. Because President Trump had the unique personality, many of our allies did not really like him. So they confused what Americans message with the messenger, and that is President Trump. So they instinctively resist our call to face the China challenge, which was global. So it's not only to us. It's to them too. So we spend quite a bit of efforts to, to basically talk to our allies to clarify our position. And in the end, um, af uh, after the uh, outbreak of the COVID, and more and more allies uh, took our side and then they came around. Um, and so, so we, we probably did more in sort of putting allies together to face China challenge, mm -hmm. so much so at the time of the power transfer in January 2020, 2021, I should say, um, our major allies, particularly our NATO, NATO allies, uh, have issued really major statements and taken specific actions to join us in combating the China threat. Mm. You have NATO's talking about, NATO leaders talking about how to get involved in this uh, peace and security in Asia Pacific, in mm. South China Sea. We did that. Right. Yeah. So uh, uh, working with allies is good, but we have to understand that America has to take the leadership role. Number two, uh, allies are important, but allies, the allies, they have their own domestic policies. They have their own national interests. Mm -hmm. Many of the allies want to cozy up to the Chinese so they could have a sizable market share when the U.S. standing up really tough on China. Mm -hmm. So many of the allies were very frankly, very opportunistic. Right? They don't necessarily go along with us on China policy. So which comes to my second point, that is when we're working with allies, we have to conduct American first policy. Mm -hmm. So we have to work with ally in dealing with our common mission to combat the common threats. We did this during the Cold War in the Soviet Union. We're now dealing with China, right? Chinese Communist Party. But America has our national interest too. So we must really take care of America first. Uh, many of our allies, they work with China against our interest. So we have to be very careful on blindly championing, working with allies unconditionally. Mm -hmm. So that's why America first is always, always the first principle uh, uh, of the U.S. government um, uh, operation. That should be. I, don't know. Mm -hmm. I think we did that, obviously. I hope the new administration will also keep that in mind. Even though they don't want to say it, but you know, listen, you know, they, are the, uh, they represent the American voters. So, I mean, we should all carry out America first. That said, what are the common misunderstandings of the American first policy from our allies? Well, I think the, the biggest misunderstanding that is uh, American first policy is equal to isolationism. It's not. Uh, America first doesn't necessarily mean that America is going to isolate itself. Uh, 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 America first is not the same as America only. Uh, we cannot really completely extricate ourselves from the global affairs. Uh, so because America, as I say, 
is a global leader in many, many aspects of our common life, right? Um, not just the military, we're all over the world, but also economic engagement, right? Our American companies are all over the place. Google, Facebook, Twitter, they're global companies, multinationals. So we cannot really completely extricate ourselves from global affairs, number one. Uh, for political purposes, for domestic political reasons, there's always the labeling of the America first as isolationism. Uh, that's not true. Uh, so that's the biggest misunderstanding uh, from my perspective.